So for today's webinar, we are very excited to introduce the Child Welfare Leadership Academy. My colleagues, Rachel Poor, Ann Baker, and Rita Hart will be facilitating today's presentation and sharing information that we really hope helps you determine if this academy might be a good fit for your program leaders. Our center is one of three that make up the Children's Bureau Capacity Building Collaborative. So with funding from the Children's Bureau, we're able to offer this training free of charge to child welfare leaders from programs that receive federal Title IV funding. We also create products and tools, provide peer networking activities, and offer individualized consultations for focused technical assistance. So some of the links that I share in the chat today will take you to where you can find more information about our array of services. So for today's presentation, I'm now going to pass it off to Rachel to open up the Academy information. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we appreciate Laura. She is always our tech help in these spaces, um, and it is makes it really easy on the, uh, those of us who are presenting. So I want to say, um, OCO, hello to each of you, and welcome to our webinar today for the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy. Um, we're going to do a little bit of introductions in, in just a few minutes, but in today's webinar, we wanna model the ways that we engage in this training. And so as we come into this virtual space today, and I can only see names of who all is attending, but I'm recognizing some names that are in there. And um, I'm glad to be with each of you all today. And we always realize that um, virtual isn't always optimal, but it is a space where we can share and connect with one another and hear about things that are important in our work. So as you come to this webinar today, and I know that people will kind of probably be signing in for the next couple of moments, but we wanna come into this space in a good way. And we open each and every one, every one of our training sessions in this way when we do the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy. And so as we come into this space in a good way today, I want everyone that is joining us to really sit where you are and take a minute just to take a couple of deep breaths. And as you are taking those deep breaths, I invite you to look around where you are and find something at your desk or maybe next to the chair you're sitting in that can be something that would ground you. Um, I would share with you all today that this is um, a little flat basket. I use this as a coaster on my um, desk and <clears throat> I'm Cherokee and I made this when I was working um, at Cherokee Nation ICW. Um, I love the colors, um, is one of my favorite things about this. But what grounds me about this is that when we weave baskets, we know that the weaving connects all different kinds of things, not only what's going on with us, um, connected to these baskets, but also, and um, it connects the basket to be made for use, right? And so when I see this at my desk, it helps ground me. Um, maybe when things can be chaotic or, or difficult, or I'm trying to make a decision, this helps to ground me into who I am and lets me take that really deep breath and come back and say, this is who I want to be in the work. So as you find that things that ground you at your desk or in your, cha or your chair, wherever you're sitting at this moment, I just would welcome you to really pause, center yourself in what it means to be a leader and as you think upon this work, and also as an opportunity to give out some thanks in whatever way that you give that, that we are all here to do this work. Um, because we are thankful that you took time out of your day to hear about what we have as the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy, um, and we hope you find this time and space beneficial to you. So we hope that you hold these feelings with you as you um, experience our sharing about the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership today, and um, that it, it gives you the ability to be in this virtual uh, space with us in a good way. So now let's talk a little bit about the foundations of this training that we are bringing to you. So as you can see on the screen on the left-hand side, 
um, you will see what is our training model. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. But we wanted to let everyone know that this training was created by and for tribal child welfare leaders. We all know that we come from various cultures and belief systems. We bring different life experiences. We have different experience in tribal programs, um, which all operate in very different and vastly different ways at times. But we want you to understand that this training is built to understand the, con the context of working in tribal child welfare programs, um, because that's very important to us. So as you see the points on the screen, um, you'll come to understand that we gathered leaders and elders and experienced child welfare people to help us identify what this training needed to be. It at this time has been through a couple of iterations. Um, and so what you are seeing um, today is the second iteration. A foundation of this acad leadership academy is that a child is a sacred gift. And we have to consider how the decisions that we make in our child serving systems and programs have um, impacts on future generations. We ask leaders in this space to consider the seven generations before them and the seven generations after, and to really understand the ripple effects that happen with our leadership decisions and our leadership moments in our tribal child welfare programs. As people engage in this training, we want you to have an understanding that we respect and honor that there are very unique systems, belief systems, clan systems, tribal operation ways all across Indian country. And so what we try to do with you is to share our culture and our ways of being and knowing with you and ask that you share those back with us and how what that means within the tribal programs that you serve. And we base this entire training really on looking at leadership through the lens of the seasonal cycles and understanding that all of this has intergenerational connectedness. And that is we are all relatives on this earth, that we are connected in many, many ways besides just looking at the systems that we go through. And it's important that we start the understanding of this academy in this way because our um, indigenous circle of leading model that you see on the left is really based on these things. And it understands that much of this is in continual, in continual change and that it honors the in generational interconnectedness that we have with all things. So let's talk about what the journey to tribal child welfare success really looks like um, in this training program. So there's four really key areas that we give you that are, that are competencies for this. And we believe um, as trainers that the competencies give us a roadmap for how we engage and move with programs and leaders in this training. We need to know where we, were, we, are, where we are going so that we know when we have reached our destination. And these help keep us focused. So here's kind of the key areas that we're looking at. We're looking at taking an Eagle's view for a clear vision and that is very important to everything we do. And throughout the training, you will hear the trainers refer to this frequently as coming up and taking the Eagle's view. And we'll talk about that a little more as we talk about our model. We talk about integrating indigenous adaptive leadership. We have so many uh, tribal child welfare leaders across the United States and through Indian country that have so much skill in the case management and the work. And that is 90% of the time what everyone is doing. But there's this 10% of the time in adaptive leadership that we might not have um, the expertise or knowledge to really work through those spaces. And those are the spaces a lot of times that can frustrate us, drain our energy as leaders. And so we talk about how is indigenous leadership already matched to serve and lead in these adaptive spaces? And ultimately, everything that we have in this training is meant to support culturally responsive practice within your tribal child welfare programs. We spend a lot of time talking about how to maintain balance and be centered as a leader, because one of our goals is promoting a healing and resilient organization. All right, so let's look at this next part and talk about um, the model. Um, and kind of the respect and honor that we have 
as we develop this model. First, I would tell you that this is focused on that cultural, supporting cultural practices, because they are a part of our decolonization and they are part of that continual healing that we have to do as tribal child welfare leaders who are working in systems that have immense trauma and who are working with a workforce that are susceptible to secondary traumatic stress. So we wanna make sure that we focus on that each tribe is unique and the concepts in this training, we really encourage you to reflect on your own leadership space. Foundationally, everything honors tribal sovereignty. Tribal sovereignty, we understand is under a continual state of change as you work within your um, tribal nations but we respect and honor that the individual beliefs, practices, and values are different in every space that we train this, that there is historical and intergenerational journeys that are particular to different communities and different leaders that are engaged in serving those communities, that healing and resiliency are a continual part of the work. And that is important as leaders that we talk about creating spaces for ourselves and our workforce to have healing and to build that resiliency for them to continue to do the work that I, I have seen so many people be, bring so much passion to and be so dedicated to. And once again, understanding that impact of our decision on the next seven generations. You heard me say earlier that a lot of this can have like ripple effects like a water, like water, like a drop of water coming into a puddle. That will come forth a little bit more as you hear more about our training, but I want you to kind of hold that vision in your head because we believe that success happens in tribal child welfare programs when our tri tribal child welfare leaders, the tribal leaders and the communities, they work together by understanding that children are sacred gifts who should be connected with their kin, their community and all of their relatives. So you have to work within collaborations uh, within your tribal programs and we understand that that collective vision needs to honor the rights of indigenous children. So we hope that this is very um, understandable to you. And we hope that you see that in what you hear about the rest of our um, training today. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one more piece and talk about um, what the learning process is with the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy. So you'll see here, we integrate various methods in a shared learning process. And we have made every effort to make this training not only a way for us to be interactive by engaging in discussion and dialogue, but we intend to be relational with you as well. We open in a good way, we close in a good way, we honor an open space when things um, that come up need to be talked about. We honor the examples and the culture that is shared and the belief systems that are shared from the communities that we bring this to. So you can see we have, um, we have an orientation um, where we talk to you about what, it, what would be the process for being part of this academy. We do a pre-engagement session where we talk about um, some of the pre-work things that you can be holding in your mind as you come to that next training day and kind of getting through all of those housekeeping pieces that we need to do before we come officially into the training space um, so that we can enter into that in a good way and get right to the learning part. We have options in our, we have e-learning stuff, we talk about soft skills, we uh, lead in uh, discussions as instructors, and we have a case study that we ask you to apply the concepts that you're learning to a leadership story, which was shared uh, with us from someone that informed this training from the very beginning. So our purpose is to transfer knowledge with everyone who attends these. And we often say as facilitators in this, um, all of those who have been part of this training, even the first iteration moving into the second, your examples, your stories, your experience, your feedback, those all become part of what this training is and how we facilitate it each and every time. And so the relational part of engaging in this training is very important because ultimately pieces of us uh, wind up in this training along the way. So we also have coaching in this area um, and as part of our academy and it's provided by trained coaches 
that are trained through the Butler Institute for Families. And the, the principal thing of coaching is to allow you to have space and time with a trained coach to work through your own professional and personal growth and to engage with that coach who is going to help you uncover your values, who is going to help you kind of provoke deeper thinking, hold multiple perspectives, and help you see who you want to be as a leader within, within the communities that you serve. It's reinforced by the learnings that you have in the uh, Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy and um, helps engage in ways that you can apply this. You have the opportunity, you'll go through coaching um, before the academy starts, throughout the academy sessions, and then you have the opportunity to actually continue that coaching relationship for about three months after the last training session has been done. Um, we find this to be a very important part of the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy, and it really helps participants um, start to unpack what the learning is, um, what the lens that they brought to this training, and how they might integrate some of the concepts into their daily leadership lives. So the training sessions themselves are typically about six-hour training sessions. We've arranged those in like four to six-day paths. Um, and we engaged um, our participants in this uh, discussion on how best can this um, leadership academy be delivered to their program. So we have some ways that we can do it. We've had some successes um, that we think we can highlight, but we wanna make sure that based upon your time, the resources that you have and who can be in attendance and focused is best done by having some, some very um, good discussion about what's the best, best way to bring this to you. So um, we have done uh, this training with um, like an open registration format where we've had tribal child welfare leaders from many programs. And we actually just finished one up where we had a, um, an entire tribal child welfare program leadership go through the training. So there are lots of options for how to engage in this training. Um, and like I said, discussing having a discussion about what's best for your organization is the easiest way for us to go. As I talk about the training sessions, I do wanna mention a little bit that these are really um, built for participants to have the opportunity to engage in group reflection, to engage in peer sharing. And then we also talked about earlier, um, completing that case study. So taking the content discussing it amongst the group, discussing it with your peers, and then applying it to a case study um, is all helped, is all there to help uh, people really integrate the knowledge into who they want to be as a leader. And we talk about your leadership journey in this training um, and help you identify what that story might be for your own leadership journey. And lastly, we end um, really our time together with people by initiating learning circles. And those learning circles are set up by our seasonal cycles. So our training starts off in the spring season and we move through spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, and that is really a metaphor for what happens in the leadership spaces. In spring, we start planting seeds. In summer, there is growth. In fall, we do the harvest. And in winter, we go back into reflection and preparation for the seasons to start again. And so that is the way that we enter these training spaces. And our learning circles are also developed in that seasonal cycle so that we can dig in a little bit to the content from those various seasons and have some more application discussion and about how they're experiencing the, con the content in their leadership uh, within their programs and what might be some other best practices for engaging in leadership moments within their tribal program. So I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Rita Hart, to um, talk about how we, how we do some of the training days. Thank you, Rachel, that was a wonderful introduction. Every time we present this, there's always something new that I hear. And I thought, oh, yeah, <laughs> we do do that. <laughs> so um, we come into this training. And but well, before I begin, let me do a quick introduction. Um, I just want to say hello to Halito, Chinchi, 
Chinky, sorry, let me get started here. Holly Toach and Chinky, Chatasia, Amahamli, a Chukma, Chihotripo, at Read the Heart, Chatasia, Hickory, Apache, Sia, Apelisa, Ikanana, Si Chia, a Tuxali, a Tali, Himak, Nitak, Chia, Fama, Likat, Sana, Yopa. I am proud to greet you in my father's Choctaw language, and my name is Rita Hart. I am Choctaw of Oklahoma and Hickory Apache, so I'm here to help and to work. As, and I work as a trainer and teacher, so I'm happy to to be to be with you today. But a little bit about myself: um, I come to you from my home here in Oklahoma. I lived in Southeast Oklahoma in the Chickasaw Nation, and I consider my mother's homelands in Northern New Mexico as my other as my second home. I have a master's and bachelor's in social work, 30 years experience in working with tribal, state, federal, and academia in the child welfare arena. It's been all my whole career, my whole life. Um, I'm now in my fifth phase of retirement and providing consultant work. So I worked in, and for the Center of Tribes, I've worked for various roles for the past five years. And for this training, I've been a facilitator and coach and hold so much respect for all the tribal programs because they gave us such rich feedback on all of these training concepts and and just knowing that you know we provided this four tribes you know some of a lot of our concepts were early on as we met with different tribal child welfare experts you know those that had experience you know years of experience and they provided so much guidance so you know just being able to present this and realize that we're finally at that time where we're going to have a uh, product that can be provided to all tribes. You know, we piloted this for several years. So it's just knowing that we can now move into the second phase of, you know, maybe doing some train the trainers. You know, there's a lot of things in the in the works that could happen in the next few years. So as we begin my part in this, um, I just want to say that Rachel did the, you know, the the ground, the foundation of the training, you know, what it is, where we've done, you know, everything that ties together. We talk a lot about connections. And so as we go into this, think about this from an indigenous way of being, an indigenous way of knowing, and an indigenous way of doing. And so everything that we present from this point forward is talking about the content. And so this one, you know, we put this up here and, and it's just part of what we do in our training. And if you read the cartoon, it's a, you know, have, and you think about it, have you ever found yourself in this situation? This is a cartoon by Rick, Richard Cate from his column, Without Reservation. And it shows the three of them not even noticing what the other is doing. And the chief is yelling, hold it, hold it. Why aren't we moving? So if you think about that in the organization, it's much like we did, you know, as, we're, as leaders, you're trying to, you know, it seems like no one's listening or people, treat, maybe they choose not to listen because they may re be resistant to change. So as a, you know, we look at this cartoon, we laugh, you know, we think we recognize that life happens, you know, we can relate to this. So as in training, we find, you know, many opportunities to laugh and enjoy the time we have with each, with each other. You know, sometimes we find this even a way of coping because, you know, in child welfare, it seems like we, we have, we call it sick humor <laughs> and we tend to use that as a coping mechanism because there are so many emotions, you know, things that are tied to our work. And so as uh, Rachel, you know, she shared a lot of the several ways, the way we teach this, but we also recognize that adult learning styles, you know, because of the content, we discuss sensitive areas, areas that evoke emotional responses. You know, we encourage self-care and we offer resources to help deal with some of those triggers because this is, you know, when we you know that secondary trauma is real and also intergenerational trauma. And so to balance that humor, you know, we use this just to say, you know, give this as an example, you know, it's just a way of relieving stress. And we realize that, you know, laughter is the best medicine. And so if we go to the next slide, let's look um, deeper into the subject of our training model. And Rachel went through some of this and she kind of gave a general overview. But this training model, it's, it's a way to promote and support cultural practices within tribal nations. The graphic symbolizes how the training we seek to increase our knowledge, our awareness, and the ongoing process of adapting tribal child welfare leadership practice through the, a cultural lens. So we respect every tribal nation is unique. I know Rachel mentioned that, you know, we honor that. And we, all, we also encourage participants to apply their own indigenous knowledge and beliefs, especially for those tribal nations that they serve. 
the training, it's interactive. You know, we have that shared learning experience which facilitates those discussions. So it's a prime opportunity to talk about our values, talk about our cultures. You know, it's grounded in the inherent knowledge of those tribal, of tribal nation and their practices. So we recognize that some of our tribal tribal for leaders may not be a citizen of that tribe or they work for and serve. So we encourage them to consider their cultural, consider these culturally based leadership practice practices for the tribal people that, that they serve. And so if you look at this model, it's an analogical way of understanding the relationship between child welfare systems and cultural and practice and beliefs. The, the model, it illustrates the interconnectedness of our indigenous way of being to all things. So you see at the center, this is who we are. It's our indigenous way of being, which is our integral connection to the tribal nation. Then the next circle is our well-being. It's our mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual health, which should, should always be in harmony and balance. And it's to be most effective in this work. And it's our self-care. You know, we deal, we talk about that many times throughout the training. You know, it's dealing with those traumatic situations that we encounter every day. And then the outer circle is the cycle of seasons. It's impacted by the living organization organisms for change and growth. It's the ever evolving child welfare system that is affected by so many different factors. And then the eagle feathers are all connected. They're connected to all the circles as our belief and values. We borrow these from the Ashanabi seven grandfather teachings only as an example. And they include love, bravery, honesty, humility, truth, respect, and wisdom. And we know these values, they ground our well-being. You know, it's our healing process in working with children and families. And so in the training, we encourage participants to explore their own values, their own practices, and embrace those cultural ways within those tribal organizations. And then at the top, you see the eagle and flight. We call this an eagle view. This is recognizing the leadership moments and taking time for a holistic adaptive approach to the work and envisioning those new possibilities. We know that effective leadership is active and reflective. And I, when I, every time we look at this, I think about one time when I was administrator in child welfare, I had a child welfare supervisor would always come to me and she'd say, I can't see the forest for the trees. You know, it was all, when she said this, it was at that moment, I knew she was so overwhelmed by everything that was going on. So it was, then I had to consciously take that eagle view to get above the fray and sometimes, you know, that chaos to see those patterns, you know, those relationships, the context of what she's talking about. And then the, and then think about practices. It's really just thinking about what's really going on. And so it's a way to identify those professional development and practice for, for our future growth. And so if we go to the next slide, then we consider how is this leadership training different? And so indigenous adaptive leadership is a practice and it's symbolic to dancing in the moment. And whenever we talked about that early on, I was thinking as we were talking, dancing in the moment. And my first thought is of a drum, you know, the beat of the drum, you know, you hear the beat of the drum. And when you're dancing, each step is in perfect timing with that drum. And so when you consider that, it's everything, it's considering that everything there is a season, a time for every purpose. So as we move through these cycle of seasons and ongoing changes, these concepts are a way of understanding being adaptive in our leadership. And so each of these concepts, it's, you know, it's being holistic. It's taking the eagle's views through those seasonal cycles or changes. It's being adaptive, having adaptive responses of an attitude, beliefs, behaviors. It's understanding that trauma and resilience. It's the community. You know, it's valuing and being servants to those who we, and then also to put them first, you know, more than our own self achievement. It's being spiritually founded. It's having those self reflective practices using spiritual teachings and ceremonies to support change and healing. It's also understanding and respecting that beliefs and ceremonial teachings are unique for individuals and even their tribal nation. You know, historically, Christianity and biblical teachings have become a foundational way of life in many indigenous cultures. And then it's flexible, you know, requires that trans transformative learning, shifts in perceptions and practices, you know, it's able to challenge that status quo. It's informal, shared authority rather than authority over, you know, it's not a hierarchy, it's pervas pervasive, 
persuasive and rather than positional authority. So it's including all those voices, you know, all the gifts that people bring, you know, it's understanding that we respect those and we, it's that reciprocity and we always have that thought, you know, how do we bring together, you know, those that could best serve. And then it's situational, you know, being able to step forward and using those gifts and strengths and acknowledging our leadership moments. And then the last one is humility. It's an understanding too that we, you know, we would make mistakes. You know, we try something else, we take risks. You know, there's always uncertainty. There's always sitting in the moment, dealing with resistance and letting go. You know, it's and then, of course, always having that self care reflection. You know, understanding that we have to find a new balance. That's part of that adaptive leadership practice. And so now we're going to go into another model. And, you know, this one, um, as you see it, you know, it looks like a pool of water. And this is building upon the indigenous circles of leading, which is at the left. And it's also incorporating some of those adaptive leadership in practice. And so then if you look at this model, it provides a indigenous holistic view of interconnectedness. This is much like the systems in which we work. So to realize the importance of our role as child welfare practitioners and how every decision we make is connected to the seven generations before us and to now and to the connection to the next seven or eight generations in the future. And so the inner circle of the indigenous circle of leading is an indigenous way of being. So it's pulling that out. It is who we are. It's our connections and it's where we come from. It's the best described as tribal sovereignty. And the definition for tribal sovereignty is a concept of inherent authority of indigenous tribes to govern themselves within the borders of the United States. And so each of us as tribal citizens has the inherent authority and governance in the role of the protector. So to capture the natural way of things, this graphic is a pool of water. It's a bit in water, it's life sustaining for all living organisms. So when you see this, the, the pool of water, anytime you touch it, the water ebbs in and out like ripples and the lines are inseparable. So you see at the top is a child. When the child's life is touched, it's like a ripple effect of who we are, who they are, their families, their kin, their communities, their tribal nation, and everything that you see within each of these circles. It's also understanding that they're an integral, integral part of <clears throat> tribal sovereignty. So each circle serves as a purpose. So if you see such as the family, the kin, language, traditions, ceremonies, those community connections, even indigenous foods, you know, and spiritual leaders, elders, all of the governmental structures within a tribal nation, each of these circles embraces and nurtures and protects that child's well-being. And so having that conceptual understanding of this intergenerational interconnectedness and tribal sovereignty has been the driver for this training. And as we bring this to the tribal, tribal water programs, we use this as a teaching tool. It's different than the Western child welfare practice of removing a child from the parent. You know, I come from the state system. And, you know, over the years, that was what, how we did things. You know, we removed a child and the only person you ever thought of was the parent. You know, you didn't think about the kin, their family, their communities, their, especially for an ICWA, you know, an ICWA case, understanding that they're attached, you know, they're a part of this tribal sovereignty. These are all of the elements that protect and support this child. So whenever we, in cultural practice, we know that a child's not only removed from their parent, but, but removed from all of these protective circles of care. And as tribal, tribal for leaders, it's important that we understand this holistically. So in the simplest of terms, you know, consider the old analogy, it takes a village to raise a child. And so now we'll go into the, the next slide, which is the key topics of cultural practice that we cover in the Leadership Academy. And so each of these concepts are connected to the leadership model in the center. The topics are the way are the ways tribal leaders consider growth and change. And we talk a lot about child welfare success, you know, what their vision, you know, things that they want to do to move forward. And the indigenous circles of leading model guides us through that journey of that understanding that interconnectedness, you know, who we are, what we bring to the organization, and how we can conduct ourselves to 
build stronger teams and communities. So each topic weaves in the leadership practice through a strength-based protective circle of care that's unique to every tribal nation. And so let's look at some of those key cultural practices. Uh, the first one is an indigenous way of being. So that's in the center of our model. You know, it reviews all of our own values that ground that grounds us and helps us to build that strength and resilience. The intergenerational protective circle, circles of care, which I just went over, it's it's uh, we also use eagle mapping, which is another way to identify those circles and build those supports. You know, it helps us to identify you know, what resources do we have? How do we mobilize them? You know, how do we, and if we have any challenges with communicate, communicating or building relationships, you know, how do we move forward? How do we engage them, you know, be, to be a part of that protective circles of care? And then the next is taking that eagle view. You know, I mentioned that earlier about getting above the fray, but it's also to recognize those, those leadership moments. You know, seeing that big picture and being able to understand where do we need to adapt, you know, to maybe some of our practices. And then the next is maintaining harmony and balance, which I think I mentioned earlier about our self-care. You know, we have to continually visit that. We have to know that we're in balance. Understanding that our mental, physical, emotional, spiritual well-being, you know, this is our continual practice that for healthy living. You know, how we're only as affected as we are healthy. And then being a healing organization, you know, as we think about um, trauma, you know, I think that's another area that we have to understand what's compromised, you know, our, our indigenous people, you know, we've been compromised by the, those historical events from, you know, from the past. So how do we now become that healing organization instead of being um, trauma inducing, we want to be trauma reducing. And then the indigenous adaptive leadership. And I mentioned that early too, but it's also just understanding the behavioral changes, you know, that supports us. You know, as we, you know, we may be dealing with different resistance or, um, you know, there's always something within the workplace that you, you know, find yourself that you would have to consider those behaviors and how do you, you know, be able to, to work through them. And as I mentioned, the trauma and secondary traumatic stress, you know, we use the four R's of trauma from SAMHSA. And the first is to realize the impact of trauma that it's far reaching, you know, it's not only affecting our children, it's affecting our tribal nations. And the second is to recognize the triggers, you know, is, and how do we cope with that trauma? And then the other is to respond, you know, with culturally responsive approaches to, to promote healing. And then the last one is to resist re-traumatization because in child welfare, the daily work, you know, when we know it's challenging, it's emotionally charged. So how do we think about preventing that re-traumatization as we work with those families or we work with our, even our own staff? So the four, arms, four R's, it informs us, you know, how we respond in leadership moments and the impact on their emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental well-being. And it's also rooted in that resilience that we know as tribal nations that we have to build, build upon from, from those generations of the historical trauma. And so then the last is immunity to change, but it's also considered resistant to change. You know, we, we mobilize people as a path to reconciliation and it requires reframing the work, you know, it allows us to see new possibilities and how they may, and it's also how some of those things may be in the way. And as we take on some of this, um, I think she froze. Let's see if she comes back to us. We were going to move into looking mm -hmm. at um, spring. Anne, if you want to start in on that and we can wrap around to Rita if she comes back. Okay, thank you, Laura. So good morning. Um, I'm Ann Baker and I have been with the Capacity Building Center for Tribes for, I think I'm in my seventh going on my eighth year. So I started during the last round of the Center for Tribes. And I'm coming to you today from Eastern Montana on the Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux Reservation, which is where I grew up in this community. 
but my I go kind of go back and forth. I live in north central Montana in Great Falls, but today this week I'm over here in uh, Fort Peck because visiting my family because I have a little new grandson that I try to get back here as often as possible to hang out with. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I won't take a lot of time. I just want to touch briefly on these next few slides and then leave some time at the end for some questions and comments and next steps and things like that. So I think as Rita and Rachel both mentioned in their presentation that the curriculum is divided by seasons. So um, it's presented, you know, like using a seasonal approach and we begin metaphorically in spring, regardless of what season of the year. So I know there was some confusion one time we were like starting in spring and everybody was like, well, no, but this is summer. So, so even if it's in the dead of winter, we'll probably start with this in, you know, in the spring. So just so because it is metaphorical. So depending on where you live, you know, spring can look a little bit different, but for, um, a lot of us, spring is a time of awakening, preparing and planting. You know, I like to use garden metaphors because I am a gardener and I like to do work outside in the spring. So there's always like, you know, we talk about, you know, new and emerging growth, you know, like when the first crocus pops up, that's a sign of spring. Um, so when we talk about spring, we're talking about emerging skills for new leaders or developing any growing skills for seasoned leaders by applying this indigenous circle of leading model. We want to explore how change happens as in it and is in fact, change is the only constant. You know, that's something I learned a long time ago. There's so much resistance to change. But, you know, I learned that the only thing you can actually count on is change because things change. Um, we learn to recognize our own leadership moments and we um, provide a framework based on the Eagle's view or the view from above to identify ways of leading and growing. So that's all the stuff that we sort of, you know, explore and discuss and share about in, in the spring season. So going into summer, let's, um, let's talk a bit about spring, summer. Summer is a time for growth and nurturing. So we're all like sort of approaching the end of summer right now. So, um, you know, summer is a time for, you know, longer days. The, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, those of us that change our clocks, you know, we have long, long days with lots of sunlight and hopefully some of us can get outside and depending again on where you live, you know, some places it's just like too hot or the weather doesn't allow it. And so maybe you spend more time inside in air conditioning, but nevertheless, um, it is a, it's a time to explore our practices and support what tribal sovereignty through child welfare means. You know, and if, if again, back to the garden metaphor, if you're a gardener, that could be um, weeding, that could be plucking out things that are no longer working for us. You know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, continuous quality improvement. So what's working, what's not, maybe something's not working and it's becoming a weed and we need to pluck that out and do away with it and look at something, grow something new. Um, we look to provide tools to support one another to do the demanding work of child welfare through cultural practices. So there's time to share, you know, with each other and in groups around, you know, what, what, do, what, what, you know, what does that look like in your own communities? We provide an opportunity to explore the impact of historic and other trauma on the workforce. Rita talked a bit about that a little bit you know, uh, like we do spend a lot of time talking about the four R's and just intergenerational trauma. We talk about um, secondary traumatic stress and self-care. You know, I for one, and I know Rita and Rachel too, we're like really big on self-care because you cannot do this work unless you're taking care of yourself. And then we also um, talk about using indigenous and adaptive processes to create a positive environment. So again, back to summer is a time for growth and nurturing and self-care. So then we move into fall. I mean, I'm advancing my slides as we go as well. So fall is a time for taking stock and harvesting. 
And so um, again, you know, one of my new little hobbies I was just sharing with Rita and, and Rachel before we got on this call is I'm a new forager. So one of the things it's like the end of summer, early fall, and I'm starting to go out and forage and look for things to harvest that I can use, you know, for my new hobby around um, plant-based medicines and things like that. If you're a gardener, you know, you're probably starting to harvest some of the bounty that's been growing in your garden, you know, or you might, some people might go to a farmer's market and take advantage of, you know, all the like fresh produce that's coming out of the fields. But for us, when we talk about um, child welfare, we're going to explore how to mobilize people and resources for adaptive change. We're going to recognize the impact of the resistance or immunity to change. And we're going to recognize how the indigenous way of being supports leaders when facing resistance or immunity to change. And we will review and further explore concepts of indigenous adaptive leadership in your work setting. So after fall, of course, then we move into the winter season. And for some of us in the north, um, you know, winter is can be like seen as a time of hibernation, a time for reflection, being thankful, planning for some folks, some communities, it's a time for storytelling. So when we get into the winter curriculum, we will be allowing participants to reflect on their values and beliefs in their, and, and then defining their own um, definition of child welfare success. So it's, it's kind of like, what does child welfare success mean to you? And what does that mean in your organization? And what does that mean for your community and your nation? Identifying and engaging in discussions about the potential for personal and organizational change. Again, I mentioned storytelling. So we, um, we do a whole section on storytelling and we invite participants to you know, talk about what's your story? You know, what is your leadership story in child welfare? And we celebrate one another's success and we give thanks and then we plan for the future, you know, that again starts again in the spring for the new emerging future that happens when spring comes upon us again. So um, let's move on to the next slide. I feel like I'm going really fast, but I wanted to leave some time here at the end. So let's just take a moment for everyone to sort of read this slide silently to yourself. So, so in thinking about leadership, you know, I think the quote starts off, you know, I learned early on, there is no one meaning or approach to leadership. When I read that, that makes me think of something I learned a long time ago. And it's, it, it's sort of like, um, it was in a different context, but the, the idea was paths that lead to the same summit. So we're all going up this mountain or hill or down a path or whatever on this journey and we're all you know on a leadership journey but that could look differently for everybody and so if we're all on this path together some of us might zip right up to the top some of us might go around and around and around you know to like and then finally get to the top of the summit some of us might zigzag back and forth to, you know like switchbacks I think they call them to get to the top some of us might go up and down this way, like you might, you know, what is that, that phrase, two steps forward, one step back or whatever. So all of us are on our own leadership journey and it's unique to ourselves. And so I just, you know, there is no one right way. So um, when we talk about our, this leadership journey, I feel like this curriculum provides a framework for you to then create your own leadership journey and whatever that will look like for you. So we're not here to prescribe, we're not to say, okay, this is the way you have to do leadership, or if you do these five things, you'll be a great leader. It's like nothing like that at all. It's all about providing this framework for you to kind of explore and share with others and to help you know, reflect on 
and attune to and create your own leadership style and journey if you don't have that already. And if you are a seasoned leader to just build on that, you know, because we can always just improve and we can always get better. And, you know, we were talking this morning about some of my own skills that I think I'm fairly good at, but I want to get better. You know, I want to improve them and I want new challenges to try to, you know, help me get better at those skills. So I think for me, that's all I have to say. I'm going to toss it back to Rachel to open it up for um, questions or comments. And hopefully people have lots of questions and we will, um, she can help you talk about what's next. Thank you. We would love you to use the Q&A feature if you have any questions that you wanted to pose for us. We'd be happy to answer those. It also helps us catalog any questions that we might not have time for so that we can respond to the group with answers to those questions as well. So if you, as you take a few minutes to start to enter questions into the Q&A, um, Laura, if you go to the next slide, we'll go ahead and start telling you about um, what are like the, what is the future for the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy? So if you are interested in bringing this training to your organization, to a consortium that you are part of, um, that you might have tribes that you work closely with around you in your area that you want to bring together and do this training together, um, we'd like to have a conversation with you. Um, myself, Rita, and Anne are all three facilitators of this training, and we want, just want to engage with you on what that might look like for your program. We anticipate having more opportunities to facilitate this training beginning in February of 2023. Um, as we are kind of closing out this year, we just finished a facilitation last week. We will uh, continue with learning circles with that group until January of 2023. So it's really in February um, when we anticipate that we could do that. So we wanna be having conversations with people who are interested between now and then so that we could get that going. Um, you can see in um, the slide, and I think Laura's going to pop it into the chat too, my email address is rachel4 at du.edu, um, and I can help organize the conversations with myself, Rita, and Anne about what this training might be um, for your program. We also rachel, have I a... Know. Oh, I just, sorry. I just wanted to mention that Brian Wani... Hi, Brian. I know you're from Hi, Oklahoma. Brian. He mentioned the... Uh, Southern Plains Child Protection team, mean, team, so I'm assuming he may be thinking about this for them. And just to share, you know, we did do two tribal consortiums, um, one in Oklahoma and then one in New Mexico. So it's doable. You know, that's even a possibility. Yes, thank you for that, because I think it's really important that people understand all the opportunities for how we um, bring this out to tribal communities. Um, also, Laura has put in the chat our Tribal Information Exchange website. There are literally hundreds of resources on there that are designed specifically for tribal child welfare programs. So please take a moment to click on that, search around, see what you can find in our YouTube channel. Um, today's webinar is being recorded um, and will be out on that YouTube channel just as soon as they have it ready. So you can pass this on um, to other people and um, let them hear about what the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy um, is and how it is built so that they can understand if it's right for their community. Um, I don't see any questions popping up in the Q&A, but I'm gonna check in with Laura and make sure she's seeing the same thing. Okay. No questions. Okay. Um, and so Brian Wani, we will, I know that myself and Rita have your contact information. So we'll reach out to you and see if we can't schedule a conversation. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, Anne, Rita, and Laura um, for everything that they bring to um, the Tribal Child Welfare Leadership Academy into this space today. Um, we, are, we are grateful. I know we have all shared this many times. We are grateful, the three of us, to have the opportunity to come into tribal communities and have these conversations with you. We feel they are important. We love to bring the experiences that we have had um, working in Indian country to you and dialogue and discuss with you about leadership and the moments that make our leadership so important. So, we um, have just a couple of minutes before the, before the top of the hour. So 
there is no goodbye in our native languages. And in, in my native language of Cherokee, we say and that is until we meet again. And so as we um, exit this virtual space today, we are honored to have the opportunity to connect with you and hope that our paths cross again in some way. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for your time.